My, my name is Kyle Foster. Thank you all for coming tonight to witness Eagle County, Colorado, break the stigma around talking about mental health. First and foremost, we'd like to thank, um, take a moment to thank our sponsors that made this possible. So thank you to our local businesses and organizations. Right. <laughs> Make sure I'm not standing in front of everybody over here. All right, first off, we got Speak Up, Reach Out, All Points North Lodge, Eagle Valley Behavioral Health, Vail Board of Realtors Foundation, Suicide Prevention Coalition of Colorado, Alpine Bank, Ewing Trucking and Construction, Lappin Family Foundation, U.S. Bank, The Barton Family in Memory of Nate Pittman, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, The Colorado Chapter, your Hope Center, and Chris Kendig Photography. And of course, huge thank you to all of you. you. All right, as we get started, a few housekeeping items. If everybody could please pull out your phone. We all have one. Hopefully you didn't leave it in the car. We're a very social organization, and we want you to take lots of pictures tonight. Take selfies, video clips, and share them all on your social networks by tagging the hashtags and ats at the screen behind me. Oh good, they're up there. <laughs> all right, what you're about to experience defines what it means to live brave. We need your help to tell the world we're here and they can learn what it means to live brave too. So share away, don't be shy. Our team will do their best to post as much as possible to help extend our reach. Since this is My Brave is a storytelling organization, I thought it would make sense to tell you a little bit about my story, how I found out about This Is My Brave, and my reason for getting involved. So I am a recovering alcoholic. I've been sober almost eight years now. Thank you. <laughs> um, I started drinking at a very young age and just continued it into adulthood, and by the time I was 27, I was drinking two plus liters of vodka a day, which even if you're a drinker, that's a lot. <laughs> and it led me to a point where my health started to decline and something just popped into my head and I decided I need to quit drinking. And it also corresponded with a lot of good things happening in my life at the time. I just moved to Eagle, I liked my job, I liked the town, and I thought I had a real chance at being happy and not needing that alcohol. And now when you drink that much, you're not supposed to just quit cold turkey. And my health wasn't great to begin with, but when I quit, it escalated current conditions and I went into severe renal failure. Liver, kidneys, pancreas, everything. Um, I looked like a Simpsons character. It was bad. Um, I tried getting help from doctors here, and they kind of pushed me aside, and eventually my mom came and got me, and got me to a hospital in Denver, down on the Front Range, and that night the doctor looked at me and he said, hey, make your peace, because you're not going to make it through the night. And I looked at the doctor and I said, mm -mm, you don't know how stubborn I am, I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> and sure enough, the doctor <laughs> walked in in the morning and he said, wow, you made it, you're right, you're stubborn. And it's been a healing and recovery journey ever since. Um, and I owe a lot of it to my friends and family and the connections I made about being open about my story. I decided in the very beginning, I didn't necessarily like what led me to that situation, but I wasn't gonna hide it. I found the more that I shared, the more connection I got, and that was instrumental and helped me continue. Um, I had a really good friend who lived here in the valley and he taught me a lot about recovering your own way because we were both really stubborn. And when people told me I had to do this or I had to do that, I said, I'm immediately not gonna do that. Um, and he's actually what brought me to speak up, reach out. Hold on, I gotta pull him out. So I brought my friend Jonathan Sharon with me tonight. We lost him to suicide in 2020. He was not only inspiring to me, but many others in the recovery community. And when he passed, it hit me pretty hard and I knew that there was something I wanted to do to try and make it so that nobody else has to carry a little box with their friends in it around. 
So I called up Speak Up, Reach Out, and I said, hey, I want to do a big bike ride fundraiser. Do you guys want to be the beneficiaries? And they were like, well, yeah, what do you want us to do? And I said, well, take the money and help me advertise a little bit. And now we've done two years of that bike ride, and it's been phenomenal. The turnout of the community has been amazing. I mean, it fills my heart with so much joy to see so many people come out that didn't even know Jonathan and even barely know me. They just saw the cause, and they showed up for it. And it's because of that connection and because of Jonathan that I choose to recover out loud so that the others that are suffering in silence know that they're not alone. And this is my brave. Thank you for hearing my story. That was the first time I've shared that story in front of so many people. One-on-one, -on -one, it's a lot easier. <laughs> Okay, we are going to take you on a journey. You're going to laugh. You're definitely going to cry. I cried during rehearsal, but I was able to hide behind my script so nobody saw. They took my script away, so I can't do that tonight. <laughs> you'll be enlightened. You'll be inspired. And our hope is that you will leave with a transformed perception of the invisibleness of mental illness, thanks to the bravery of our cast members. This is the reality. One in five. One in five. Let that sink in. Americans live with a diagnosable mental health disorder. We don't talk about it enough. And often, people suffer in silence. That changes today, right here on this stage. We're shining a light on mental illness to show the world that we're your friends, your colleagues, neighbors, and community members. We hope that through our storytelling, we'll better understand mental illness, and we'll be able to be supportive to those in your life who may be experiencing it. You may be inspired to share your own story. It's when we share our stories that we open up conversation, connection, and storytelling saves lives. We're very grateful to have Katie Grana, Director of Programming for This Is My Brave. She's somewhere around here. I can't see her with the lights. But she'll be up here in a minute. She comes to us all the way from St. Louis, Missouri, representing the This Is My Brave National Office based out of Leesburg, Virginia. Please give me a hand in welcoming Katie Grana. Kyle, thanks so much for already making me cry. <laughs> yes, I didn't hear that last night. Um, hi everyone, my name is Katie Grana and I'm the Director of Programming with This Is My Brave. I'm really so excited to be here this evening for This Is My Brave, the show in Eagle Valley. After a long break from the stage due to the COVID pandemic, we are thrilled to be here tonight. This is our 85th show as an organization and our very first show here in Eagle Valley. This wouldn't be possible without the work. Yes, applaud, please. Thank you. This truly wouldn't be possible without the work and dedication put in by our friends at Speak Up, Reach Out and the brave storytellers that you are about to meet from your own community. I would like to recognize our national sponsors who have made this season of Brave possible. Many thanks to Abvi, Janssen Neuroscience, Society of Valued Minds, brought to you by Otsuka Pharmaceuticals, Alchemies, and Sage Therapeutics. Locally, the Eagle Valley community has shown up and offered an incredible amount of support to make this event a success. So thank you to everyone who has played a role in this production. It truly takes a village. Thank you. In case you aren't familiar with how This Is My Brave began, I want to share a quick overview with you. This Is My Brave was created in 2014 by Jennifer Marshall and Anne-Marie Ames. For seven years, Jennifer Marshall led this organization fearlessly, taking us from one show of 11 storytellers in Arlington, Virginia, to over 80 shows across the country, it's the 85th, pretty exciting, with an alumni community of nearly 1,000 storytellers. Jen stepped down at the end of 2021, so we are here to continue her work, combining storytelling and the performing arts to break down stigma surrounding mental illness and addiction. Because this is a storytelling organization, I wanna tell you how I became involved with This Is My Brave. In June of 2018, I lost one of my best friends, Jason Clayfish, to suicide after a nearly lifelong battle with bipolar disorder and depression. 
A few months later, in a desperate search to find something online that would help me understand Jason's death a bit more, I stumbled across This Is My Brave. I immediately knew that it was an organization that I needed to be involved with. Between my own personal struggles with PTSD, anxiety, and depression, and a newly found fire inside of me to not let anyone else be hurt by my, or, I'm sorry, be hurt by suicide. This is my brave became a silver lining, allowing me to turn my grief and sorrow and personal struggles into action on a daily basis. I'm proud of the work that we do every day and being here tonight, meeting all of you. The Storytellers production team, it's what gives me the most hope that I didn't think I'd find again. This Is My Brave believes that when one person shares their story, it gives others the permission to do the same. Brave multiplies brave. Our brave cast tonight is about to join a community of storytellers from all over the country who have decided to share their brave on our stage. This Is My Brave's vision is to get to a place where one day we will no longer have to call it brave to speak openly about mental illness and addiction. We will simply call it talking. You are about to experience something magical and you will be tra transformed after this event. Thank you so much for being here tonight and showing your support to our brave storytellers and producers. I hope you find some brave in yourself after this experience and share it with someone you love. Now it is my honor to welcome Carrie Konopasik performing the brave, This Is My Brave theme song, Tell Them I'm Brave, written by Natalie Lane and Phoebe Scott. Welcome Carrie. Hi everyone, hi. <laughs> it is so amazing to see you all here. Everybody's just gonna. <laughs> let it out, let it out, come on. It's all right. Um, my name is Carrie, and um, my ability to be present here tonight, a couple years ago, was definitely in question. <laughs> um, but with the help and the support of so many unselfish people in our community. Um, I made it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'll keep it pretty short and sweet. Um, but in my recovery, um, if you know me at all, I want to learn a lot about everything. If I experience something, I want to learn as much as I can about it. And so um, I started attending the classes and um, the events that Speak Up Reach Out organizes and offers to our community. And I learned how to be a part of the solution. Um, and I learned that it's okay to speak openly about everything that so many of us experience, that all of us experience. Um, and beyond that, I am just incredibly honored and grateful and happy to share the stage with these amazing men and women and with the cast and the crew um, who are 100% brave to be here tonight and share their stories. Um, just incredibly honored. Um, so anyway, we got this. <laughs> I thought there was no way out Yeah, I used to be scared of the light And I was swallowed by doubt I'd forgotten what freedom was like Puzzle pieces on the floor They don't fit in anymore I'm changing I'm changing when they ask me who I am, what I've done, where I've been, there's one thing I need you to say. Tell them I'm brave. See it on my face. I am bigger than anything coming my way. It's a new day. I'm not afraid. So if anyone asks you how I overcame, you can tell them. I'm brave. Some days I come out on top 
And some days I can't catch a break But when the fire don't stop I won't wish my troubles away I've been down and I've been out But if you look at me now I'm blooming, I'm moving Into better, brighter days Yeah, this hope is here to stay there's only one thing you can say. Hey, tell them I'm brave. Sit on my face. I am bigger than anything coming my way. It's a new day. Yeah, I'm not afraid. So if anyone asks you how I overcame, you can tell them I'm brave. That was supposed to be a duet, but I got told because I can't sing that nobody wanted to see that, so it got cut. So we just let Carrie handle it, but that's okay. So help me in welcoming our first brave storyteller, Danny Rodriguez. You shouldn't be on stage. You still have time to go away. You're not worth it. You're so ugly. Fea, asqueroso, horrible! You should be dead. You don't deserve to be here today. Stop! Stop. I am brave. I can do this. My name is Daniela, and I'm a recovering alcoholic addict and suicide survivor. I didn't plan my life to go this way. You know that moment when you're a child and people will start asking you, what are you going to be when you grow up? ¿Qué vas a hacer cuando crezcas? My answer was not to say, oh yes, I will be waking up every day and try to kill myself, or drink and abuse substances. 24-7. My answer actually was, I want to be a teacher. I want to be an English teacher, like Miss Vilma. I just remember wanting to die since I was 14 years old. I would go to bed every night and pray to God, please, please, I don't want to wake up tomorrow. What a waste of time. God doesn't exist. At 15, I started drinking. I felt so good because all the thoughts and negative ideas, they would just come down and go away. Later, I started smoking. 20, later, 20 years later, I was drinking and smoking every single day. But no matter how much I used, the pain, the suffering here didn't go away. 
I was standing in a very gross, ugly, and lonely place. I was actually slowly dying. I touched bottom, and it wasn't fun. Believe me, it was shaky. Smelled like vomit. Actually, ironically, between five and seven, it was the worst time of my day. That's when I start having my first panic attacks. And one night, I had one. And the police came. And two women. And one of them told me, look up. Look up to the light. That's when I have hope. That's when I saw that there was hope in my life. And whatever that I wanted to do, I was not have to do it alone. No iba a estar sola más tiempo. That's where I just started the recovery process. And I wasn't alone. And I was asking for help. One day at a time, one month at a time, four years later. Today, I feel more than ever. And don't get me wrong, those thoughts come pretty often. Actually, they are right there outside. But you know what? I just tell them, not today. Because today I want to live. Today I'm passionate. I have determination. Estoy viva. I have pasión. Tengo fuego en dentro de mí. Y determinación. If I can do it, you can do it too. And remember, you can always ask for help. Can you help me? I'm Danny, and this is my brave. Our second storyteller will be sharing a story about surviving a recreational logging accident. Please welcome Alex Mentling. Thank you. July 21, 2018. Okay, and what's going on there? Uh, we've got a gentleman trapped under a Polaris Ranger, and he's, he's in bad shape. Is he conscious right now? July 21st, 2018. This is the personal protective equipment I was wearing. Helmet with integrated hearing protection, Kevlar chaps, cotton shirt, orange vest, gloves. I also had a camelback on. This was a chainsaw I was operating when an 1800 pound all-terrain vehicle struck me from behind. No warning. I was drugged underneath the vehicle I thought it would spit me out the back and I'd be just fine. Wasn't the case. It hit a rock about that big, crushing me and trapping me for approximately 45 minutes. A medical helicopter was dispatched from Hayden, Colorado. I was released from underneath the machine and eventually hauled on a backboard up to the top of the hill where the helicopter could land safely. I was airlifted to a level one trauma center in Denver. My injuries were deemed non-life-threatening, my physical injuries, that is. I had a brachial plexus injury, which is a fancy word for saying my right arm and hand were, were numb, multiple broken ribs, crushed ankle, Edema, I had some puncture wounds, 
that once I was released from the hospital, I actually had to go back in the hospital to get treated for a raging infection. My physical injuries eventually healed. This accident, I really feel fortunate. It was as if I won the lucky to believe, uh, lucky to believe, yeah, that too. Lucky to be alive lottery. Running a chainsaw. Less than 36 months after the accident, came home from work. I'm a contractor, warming up my oven for a frozen pizza. There was a nine millimeter pistol sitting to the left side of my kitchen sink. The thought crossed my mind. I could end my pain. I could end the struggle. I could end it all. I always told myself I would never take my own life as long as my parents were still alive. I'm happy to announce September 1st of this year, they celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary. Pretty special. In a couple days, I'm gonna go down and see them in Boulder, where I'm from. Although I survived my physical injuries, I was touched by the silent killer, post-traumatic stress. In my case, it was untreated, and it was undiagnosed. I'm a contractor, I was fairly high functioning to what anyone would see from the outside, but I was really in a world of hurt. Compared suffering as a fool's errand, compared joy as a death trap. I didn't share my feelings. I didn't open up to people. One of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress is hypervigilance, not feeling safe on the planet. My hypervigilance was presented when I could not go to bed. Now, I didn't say sleep, but I couldn't go to bed without a rifle, a shotgun, and a couple pistols by my side. I consider myself a safe gun owner and a responsible gun owner but this post-traumatic stress had really got to me. I was circling the drain. The only reason I stand here on this stage is because these great organizations like Speak Up, Reach Out, the Hope Center, Colorado Crisis Center. So I did two really key things to get me here tonight. One is I called a friend and I separated myself from my firearms. I'm not here to debate the Second Amendment. I'm not here to tell anybody how to live their life. But that was a really critical step for me. The second thing I did is I asked for help, and I'll tell you exactly how specifically I asked for help. I started calling the Colorado Crisis Line. They have a peer support, open from seven to midnight, seven days a week. If they're busy, leave your message, they will call you back. There was one day that was so bad for me, I called four times. Every time I called, they welcomed me. They were glad to hear from me. I knew most of them on a first name basis. I say, this is Alex from Eagle. At times I felt like they were the only friends I had. This is October, this is a special month for me. Starting back in 1992, I moved to this valley in October. I lived right here close to Edwards. This theater wasn't here, it was a stone yard. So I'm 30 years in this county. That was October of 1992. I started my remodeling construction business in October of 1994. And I took my last drink of alcohol in October of 2010. I've been sober from alcohol for Sunday will be 30 years. <laughs> my math is off. <laughs> Let's, let's try 12 years. <laughs> so it's really special for me to be here. I see friends out here, and I just feel really honored to be here. 
I would argue that everybody in the, out there, here, we all have a pain to purpose story, turning lemons into lemonade. My pain to purpose story isn't unique. Everybody has one. As a result of this accident, my sobriety, three and a half years ago, I started a podcast. Like any good podcaster, they're going to promote their podcast on a show like this. It's called The Builder's Journey. It's on Apple, iTunes, Spotify. And you're all welcome on the show anytime. Here's my formula for turning lemons into lemonade or turning pain into purpose. One, never give up. I know this is a cliche, but also we're all in this thing together. And the third thing is stick around. Access the support, access these people. We're hashtag reducing the stigma by being here. Everybody in this auditorium today is part of the solution. So thank you for being here. By the grace of God, higher power, universe, whatever you want to believe in, I've been able to cha change my post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth. Truly blessed to be the recipient and the winner of the Lucky to Be Alive lottery. doing? Is he still conscious? Is he still breathing normally? My name's Alex, and this is my brave. I have two new phrases from your story that I learned yesterday and today. Pain into purpose and post-traumatic growth. I like both of those a lot. <laughs> Those are good points. Thank you. Our next storyteller will be sharing through her own poetry, The Suicide of a Family Member. Please welcome Sherry Hall. Good evening. Thank you for all coming to hear our stories tonight, especially with the weather turning like it did. But this is Colorado in the fall. <laughs> I'm sharing my son's story as he grew up, who was suffering the usual teen angst as well as bipolar disorder. At age 50, he felt defeated by his disease and took his own life on February 25th, 2020. That disease was called manic depressive back then, and it wasn't talked about, and not a lot was known about it. My poems reflect some of his struggles and my reaction to them. To survive trauma, one must be able to tell a story about it. My first poem um, is entitled Gare Bear. Uh, I wrote it when he was uh, 15. I know that it's a difficult time for you, my son, being on the brink of boy and manhood, not knowing which one suits you best. Are you, my little boy, are you my little boy called Bear, who likes to play soldiers and guns, cars and trucks, Legos and building blocks, to still be a monster on Halloween? and to open lots of presents at Christmas and birthdays. Where are the days of putting up tents in the yard and everywhere in the house? The projects of wood and cardboard all over the place and the stuffed animals I tucked in with you at night. A handsome young man is taking his place who likes to play the drums, video games, hanging out at the skating rink, rock music, and mostly girls. <laughs> I will miss my little bear, 
but he will always be with this wonderful young man called Gary. Oh, where is it? Okay, the second poem I wrote, um, he was 17. Confused and angry, rejecting of hugs, my handsome young son sifts through his feelings with booze and drugs. To get him through these tough times, my love just isn't enough. He thinks I'm being mean and much too tough. He doesn't care that his bright light isn't shining through. He doesn't even realize the people who care for him as they do. My heart is torn up and so sad. Whenever his will is so strong, I know I have to stop asking myself, where did I go wrong? Uh, this was uh, written uh, again when he was 17. He thinks I'm picking on him. Little does he know. I want only the best for him as far as his imagination will grow. Success and happiness are his if he reaches out to grasp what they mean. He will find out the world is not always what it seems. Blinded by his fears, anger, and rejection, he sticks, he strikes out at my love and protection. Stand back, but stay close, Mom. Let him stumble and grow. Release him with love. You know he's being watched softly from above. Uh, this was written um, after he passed away, and um, it's entitled, She Just Said No. When I asked for some of my beloved son's ashes, she said, no, they belong here with his family. W wait, what? I am his family. I gave him life and raised him with a lot of strife. May I just have a few of his things, I asked. One of his Snoopy shirts, a pair of his torn jeans that he always liked to wear. Certainly the Batman Russian doll I found for him in the outdoor market in Moscow. And could I have some of his Batman cards? I'll have to think about it, she replied. A box arrived some months later with an Arizona postmark. I looked at the box and thought, oh dear, what did I order from Amazon now? <laughs> when I opened the box, there was Snoopy's face staring up at me. Tears poured down my face as I lifted each item from the box. A note taped to the box. A note taped to one item said, open the Batman doll first. The third largest doll had a silver chain with a round pinman, pendant holding some of my son's ashes. The waterworks were in full action by then. After drying my tears, I noticed there was more writing on this note saying, I want this necklace back when you pass away. I smiled as I thought, there is no way in hell that that will happen. <laughs> I'm Sherry and this is my break. So I'm gonna welcome Sean Boggs to the stage but I've just been informed we're gonna show the movie first, then he's gonna join us. We like to switch things up, keep you on your toes. Um, but he will be sharing with us a short film that he created, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, and Speak Up, Reach Out, as well as what I've gathered, many different team members, right? So please enjoy, and then we'll be talking to Sean.
Dear Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't realize how alone I was until I asked for help and no one came. I had pressure, I had stress. I dropped hints, I dropped jokes, but no one listened. I needed help. I wanted your help. I didn't know how to ask you without making you too worried or getting sent away from home. I know you love me. I'm so sorry. I had to. This was my only way out. My darling son, I'm the one who's sorry. I realize that you, what you were going through was so complex. It seemed like you had everything. You have a family that loves you. You have, you've got, you've got food on your table. You don't have, you didn't, I didn't see anything wrong. I didn't understand how you could feel that way when you had everything. I couldn't hear. I am so sad. So angry at myself. So confused. I'm sorry. Broken. Dear Dad, I'm sorry. My darling son, I had no idea you were feeling this way. I just feel trapped and alone and stupid and I hate myself. I'm not the parent that you need me to be. Let's work on this together. I feel alone and worthless. I'm scared to tell you, I'm worried you won't take me seriously or you'll get mad at me or hate me. I hear you. There has been some anger. We'll work on that. Together, will you help me? Yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry, Dad. I'm so sorry. 
All right, real quick, really important. Uh, National Endowment for the Arts, Speak Up, Reach Out. Uh, Jonah and, and Jake Clearman, Safir Clearman, Tom McAllister, uh, Michael Fox, Ian Kelsall, Nick Orris, Sam Boggs, Arthur Wessel, Crazy Al, and Barb DeRosiers. You probably know Crazy Al. Uh, the musicians, Lee, Evan, Kyla, Desiree, and Ian. Uh, those are all the people that helped make this movie. Um, and that's the real story of this. What happened was my son and I, he's back there, Sam. Where is he? There he is. We were going to just make that picture of a person in the middle of a merry-go-round with the camera on the outside where the person stays still but the world spins. And it was supposed to be an... Uh, an analogy for losing control. Uh, and while we were doing that, my daughter's friend killed herself. Uh, and so we just changed it then. Then it became a short about suicide. And then I was talking to my friends and colleagues that also make films and TV shows. And it something really changed there. Um, something that I thought was sort of like a minority, something that maybe me and just a few people were going through turned out to be something that everybody was going through. Every artist that I talked to heard about the project and said, I want to help. And, you know, I said yes to all of them. In the end, there were 34 people from all around the world. Uh, our illustrator is the guy who does Batman. His name's Dave Royce. He's out of New York City. The uh, animators are out of... Uh, Berlin, and they're the people that made the movie uh, Underworld, if you're familiar with that. There are seven Emmys on the crew. Walter Mather is a local director of photography who makes a lot of TV shows you watch. He came and helped. Rob Stuckey's out of Mintern. Uh, same thing, Emmy Award winning guy came to help. When I started talking to him about it, every one of them said, I'll help you because, and then they told a story. Uh, the two people that wrote the movie, one wrote a suicide letter, the other one received one from their kid. Uh, um, my story, the reason that it hits home for me is, is when I was f around three or four years old, I watched my mom try to kill herself. Uh, it didn't work that time. She tried again later and also didn't work. Um, you know, like one message I would say right now is, I know my mom right now is really glad she's alive. So she went through some tough times, you know, considered taking her own life, uh, but didn't or, or couldn't pull it off at the one time and the other time. Well, really, she tried really hard both times, really. But now she's alive and she's really happy about that. Um, and so what I learned is that, like it's like I heard here that it's like one in five people are struggling with mental health. Everyone is affected by suicide. You're either, you either have tried it yourself or you know someone really close that did. Uh, so that stigma is gone. That part is over for all of us. Like I, we all know it really intimately that it really just, you're not gonna scare anybody away by saying you're struggling. Uh, that's just normal. So uh, thanks for checking that out. This is our brave. It was a really big endeavor by a lot of people. So it wasn't really mine, but I, I just happened to be the one here. So thanks a lot. I love all y'all. I don't know who it is, but it was the same thing last night. The lights go out, and somebody starts cutting onions. My eyes got a little teary. I think it might have been you, Travis, our director. Was it you? <laughs> okay. So now in the middle of our show, we are going to talk about Speak Up, Reach Out's Hope Mural Project. It is an initiative to raise awareness, encourage connection, reduce stigma, 
and provide an artistic outlet for issues surrounding mental health in our community. It is an organized effort to provide long-lasting, visually compelling, and accessible messaging around mental health. Artist Tina Medina, a Colorado native born and raised in Vail, or sorry, in the Vail Valley, has created everything from graphic art, hand-painted body art and jewelry, to larger public art pieces, such as the one created for Speak Up, Reach Out, which is currently making its way around Eagle. We have a picture of it just behind me. It is titled Flutterby and was inspired by the breathtaking Colorado mountains and the nature that surrounds us. It's a project meant to start conversations and gather people together. It's a place to go for anyone who is grieving or for everyone who has lost someone. A safe space to talk to others who may have similar stories as you. A place to go when you may be feeling lost. Flutterby is an icon of how strong you really are and that you can overcome anything. Spreading positive lights and energy into the community. Flutterby reminds us all just how strong and resilient we can be. Thank you, Tina, for your work and your support. Is, is Tina here tonight? No, she can move. Okay, I guess not. <laughs> Our next artist is Elise Holmes. They've been an Eagle County resident for 10 years and currently lives in Minturn with her husband and two children. She's been a yoga and meditation teacher for many of those years. And having endured her own depression and anxiety, wants to help provide messaging and imagery to help others. Elise, a graphic designer, and her husband, Matt, own Quetzal, formerly Vela Apparel, in Eagle Vale. And this is their piece behind me. It is titled, Keep Going. It's on the east corner of the Minturn Town Hall and incorporates the mountains, color, and a message of hope. Elise believes allowing the viewer to have a moment of reflection upon viewing her mur mural will remind them there is more than the daily stressors and struggles in each of our heads. After growing up with the stigma surrounding mental health issues that she and so many others have struggled with, Elise was honored to be part of this project and break down those stigmas and let others know they are not alone. Keep going, keep looking up, keep working and finding what is next for you in the hard times. You can do it, there is always hope. Please help me in welcoming our next storyteller, Mickey Jones, who will be discussing a healing journey through her CPTSD. Um, hi, I'm Mickey, I'm 23, I'm a Gemini, and I have been through the ringer. But who hasn't? Um, I know that the entire human race um, has seen some stuff, been through some stuff, and is probably going through some stuff as we're speaking, aside from me. But I hope, against all hope, and I wish against all wishes, that my story and my journey can help anyone get through whatever it is that they need to get through. So here's where I'll begin. When I was nine, I thought my body was not mine. A boy in my class got grabby and crass, and I didn't feel free as time went past. And when I finally told someone, doesn't add any relevance to who it was, I was told to just ignore that and walk through life with love. But how do you walk with love when every mirror you pass, you hate what you see? How the hell was I supposed to love other people when I didn't even love me? At 12, I run into the same problem. I've been through this before. I think to myself, I should know how to solve this. But I didn't, I couldn't, and all I felt was this blind rage with nothing to dissolve it. And then eventually, I fled from school and found myself in a new cage. Small towns amuse me, but what I can't understand is why little girls are forced to be silenced on the topic of those who hurt them being at hand. I didn't want to leave my school. I really didn't want to go, but it was his comfort or my safety. And I guess my education was just too much for that district to tow. Fast forward. 
I'm a little more grown. And I am living and I'm loving in ways that I have never known. But all that would come crashing down just 12 hours after I turned 17. They say the first time is supposed to be magical, but I don't think I can feel what they mean. Because in that moment, I am in so much pain, and I will be for several moments, until someone he tells me is easier comes around. And for the first time, like trash, I'm dumped. Many boys I loved after this. Many girls, too, but I can't recall all their names. <laughs> I keep looking for something different, something more, something new, but all of that keeps ending the same until one day, I'm angry. And I tell the town what's on my mind. But apparently, some little girls aren't as nice, they aren't as deserving, and certainly not as kind. I ask myself as I sit in City Hall, why does any of that matter? Why can't we just fall? Why can't we just fall safe in your arms, and why can't you tell us that you care? But I guess since we're not good girls, I'll guess you just don't care. You don't care what grown men do to them. You only care that they don't curse. But is cursing really such a deal breaker to what little legacy they have when grown men put them in a hearse? Oh, wait. Their funerals are your talent shows, where you climb that stage and spew. You don't care where they go after that, just as long as all eyes are on you. Did it ever cross your mind that your life isn't what our earth revolves around? Did it ever make your heart stop when you heard any other sound? Like the ones that don't come out of your mouth, like the views that aren't your own? Oh, wait! I'm being too loud. I better shut up quick before I also end up in the ground. I've been through so much, and disrespect falls in the middle of this Venn diagram of all the ways that I've crashed. It's almost hard to relax when I'm OK, because I'm so used to being this ashtray for men who said they'd be there, but you never showed up. You never followed up. You never filled my cup. So I don't really care. I don't care how you fall. I don't care how you rise, because I found peace in ways that you'll never come to realize. You'll never realize the nuance of what others go through, and you'll never feel the pain that I went through to be as gentle as I am, to be as kind as I try to be. And you'll never care to know about how I came to realize all these lies. So thank you, I guess. It took me long enough to see that no matter the beatings, there is one thing you can't beat out of me. I won't bother to explain. I know you know what it is. I will say, however, despite all odds, I'll pass it along to this next generation of kids. I will be who I needed when I was their age, and no matter the twists, I will help them harbor that rage, help them turn it into something that will change the world into someplace more inhabitable. Instead of what I spewed out when I was a kid, with my delivery sad and dull. Thank you for the pain. Despite it, I've made a good life, but screw you for the hurt and your barks that are worse than my bite. I don't bite to draw blood. That's just a warning. For if you keep choosing to lead with hurt, your solitude will swiftly start swarming. I am Mickey Jones, and this is my brave. Please help me in welcoming our next storyteller. They will be speaking in regards to veterans, post-traumatic stress, and how peer support and connection can make all the difference. Please help me welcome Sarah Alder. I'm almost plugged in. When most think of a veteran, myself included, we tend to think of grandpa who fought in World War II or our uncle isolating himself in rural parts of America after serving in Vietnam. Tiffany is not what most of us would think of as an Army veteran. Like a lot of my fellow veterans, she experienced severe trauma during her service. The first time I met Tiffany was the same night she asked me if I would be her model to wear a dress, a dress completely made of paper, this dress. Before I met Tiffany, <laughs> She had a general idea for her project, but it later evolved and quite drastically at that. 
The stress was specifically and articulately designed to convey the story of many service members and veterans that live with post-traumatic stress, a red dog tag, or have experienced excruciating suffering which facilitated in taking their own lives, a black dog tag. This dress was her story. Receiving a phone call in the middle of the night from another veteran can be unnerving, especially when they tell you they've done all they can to help a veteran from choosing suicide, and hopefully a fellow female veteran will help her feel safe in this situation. I'd never been to this building. I've never met the person on the other side of that door. But what I did know is that she was a fellow veteran in the whirlwinds of a post-traumatic stress episode triggered a few days prior, which had escalated to suicidality. As I walked in, I noticed the apartment in total disarray. There were random objects scattered across the floor. The room permeated that familiar smell we've been in, when we've been in the house for days on end and nothing is fresh. We know the one. The COVID lockdown smell. <laughs> Everything felt lifeless, flat, stale. Looking around the room, there was a queen-size bed in the corner of the living room. Sitting on it were five people facing the far corner where the bed met the converging walls of the room. Tiffany was sitting in the corner cowering as everyone huddled around her to show support and care with desperate intention. She looked like a wounded animal, a death and terrified, trapped. I told everyone to leave. After they left, it felt as if the entire apartment sighed with relief. <sighs> Tiffany visibly relaxed. The external threat had finally left. Good intentions, all of them, but there was something missing in their delivery. Sitting down gently on, on the edge, asking if it, her if it was okay for me to do so, I started with the basics. My name is Sarah, can you tell me your name? Tiffany, can you tell me the last time you ate? Uh, I, I think I ate something this morning. No, last night. What about water? Are you drinking any water? Oh, I, I have a cup here. Are there any medications you're required to take? I, I, yeah, I just took them. I went through these and other questions that made her feel human, connect to her body, and really check in with herself. As she continued to relax, we were able to talk about why she, I was asked to come. Her world was imploding, and she was feeling very suicidal for the last few days, and it just got worse as time went on. When all of her friends arrived, they were ill-prepared on how to provide what she needed in that moment. Good intention, nonetheless. We talked for a little while about where she was at mentally and emotionally. She softened as our conversation progressed and revealed more about her trauma, what triggered it, how she chose to cope, which none of it was working. So she called our mutual friend over to help. Tiffany was not seeking anything except ex emotional connection and presence. She required pure, radical acceptance for how shitty she was feeling, not to be convinced to stay in this world because it would make someone else feel sad or hurt by losing her. She needed someone to just sit and be with her, right next to her in all of her shittiness, shame, self-loathing, and suffering. Sharing those moments of acceptance and connection, supporting her to the other side of those intense and horrible emotions, that was the beginning of true healing. Presence was all that was necessary. Collectively, there has been a trend to use the term mental health as an all-encompassing term of self-care despite what we are choosing to do for ourselves ordering our triple grande vodka Xanax latte to go, declaring vehemently that we really needed this because it's been a stressful day and it's really good for my mental health. What is really happening is that we are so disconnected from ourselves and any suffering we might be experiencing, suffering that escalates from a space of discomfort or disease and then turning into disease. 
We numb it, we ignore it, it evolves into something bigger. It, the stories we tell ourselves about our experience perpetuate further suffering. We all have them. The d ugly, dark little lies we tell ourselves to keep us from truly being happy or whole. We obsess about it. We become it. We, because we have told ourselves how true it is. Then we hate ourselves for it. At certain moments, that suffering pushes up some of us right up to the edge. Right up to the edge of our own existence with the awareness of only having one way out. Many of us here have lived through that moment or seen that moment in others. Some not surviving that moment at all. But this was not the case for Tiffany. Not today. Today was going to be her alive day where she gets a new moment to start over. Back at the apartment with Tiffany, we started to laugh and connect more. I knew she needed to get out of the house after three darkly isolated days. A select few of us went to a late night coffee shop, connecting, talking, and taking a deep breath of relief. Tiffany was safe. <laughs> Tiffany was getting excited, animated, and more present, talking about her future and plans with her fa fashion design program at the Art Institute of Colorado. Turning to me suddenly, Tiffany asked Sarah, do you want to be my model for the paper fashion show? <laughs> Five months later, after that night, I was literally being super glued into a green woven paper corset <laughs> slipping on my own black army combat boots and proudly, yet somberly, walking down the runway, wearing hundreds of paper dog tags that represented stories of veterans and service members a moment away from or just after the worst moment of their lives. Tiffany was not being represented by a black dog tag. Today, Tiffany is very much alive and living her life more fully after the darkest moments she had ever experienced. As most people, she lives, lives life receiving some bumps and bruises along the way, but she is so very much alive. I, for one, am so grateful that she is. The legacy of her story, our story, all our veterans and service member stories is on permanent display at the Rocky Mountain Regional VA Medical Center in Aurora, Colorado, reminding veterans they're never alone and we can always rely on the strength and support of our collective camouflage corset. I'm Sarah Alder and this is our brave. So closing out our performances and stories tonight, is going to be our born and raised local, Chris Davis. Hi. So this is the first time I've fully divulged my story to a lot of people. So just hang on with me as we go. Uh, when I was 16, I was diagnosed with OCD and depression. Uh, but I struggled long before that. When I was in grade school, uh, my compulsions were at the worst. I had to do things uh, always in an even number of times, whether it was opening and closing the door, flushing the toilet twice, uh, odd numbers are bad, even numbers good. It, it goes on from there. But as I started to get older, the depression started to sink in a lot more. I started to internalize a lot of my thoughts and feelings, and uh, it just started growing. When I was um, in eighth grade, I started drinking and using substan substances pretty heavily. And that carried on until I was about 25. But um, it was obviously not a very good mix. It helped for a while, but very quickly it started uh, becoming my own worst enemy. And also around that same time when I was around 15, 16, I was struggling with my sexuality. I was convinced that if I was going to be gay or bisexual that I was going to take my own life. Uh, I had made a pact with myself that if I ever were to take any action in that realm then I would have to commit suicide out of pure fear and discomfort. Um, but kind of the main part of my life where I'm at today occurred when I was 18 and I received a series of concussions in a hockey tournament when, yeah, when I was just about 18. and. I've had a lot of concussions, the number's over 10, but those three were in about a month and a half. And I, ever since that day, I've dealt with chronic migraine, chronic pain in my neck from cervical instability, 
as well as a slew of other medical terms. Um, and I guess the one part that I did forget to mention was, uh, no, I guess I did bring it up briefly, but you know, the suicidal ideation started when I was around 15 or 16 and it um, picked up pretty heavily again after those head injuries. It really took me a long time to figure out what my purpose was in this world and I'm still working on that. But one thing that has stuck with me ever since I was 18 is when I got my first uh, musical instrument that I, uh, was my own actual one, and it was a banjo. And it took a while for me to really, you know, make progress with it. But I'd like to play you guys a little piece that I've written um, and just to kind of show you that it's something that stuck with me and I've gotten a lot out of my experience no matter how negative it has been. Had a technical difficulty, so the acoustics are good. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, everybody in the audience. I'd like to have all of our brave storytellers stand up. Power pose. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is their brave. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Erin Ivey, and I'm the executive director for Speak Up, Reach Out. This show has been a dream of mine for this community for about four years, and the big group of people came together to make this possible tonight, and I just want to take a quick moment to recognize all of them. So if I could have the Speak Up, Reach Out staff, those of you who helped us with the production of This Is My Brave, come and join us up here in the front. <laughs> this would not be possible without these people here in the front. We have our director, Travis Wilson. We have the mental health professional that's been helping us all through the way, Teresa Haynes. And let's give it up one more round of applause for our MC, Kyle Foster. And once again, for our brave singer, Carrie. <laughs> again, this wouldn't be possible without every single one of you here. Thank you for helping us break down the stigma. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Kyle for just a couple more closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. All right. So I worked on this last night, the crew may have heard it, but there was a quote that came to mind, and I may not get it quite right, but we're going to try. So they say that one person can't change the whole world, but one person can change someone else's entire world. And I like to think that our brave storytellers tonight may have just done that for somebody out in the audience, or somebody that may see this in the future. So... Thank you for sharing your stories, and I commend each and every one of you for your bravery, for getting up here and expressing yourselves the way that you did.
Tonight, our brave cast was able to shine a light on a topic that we don't talk about enough. I'd like to take a moment to ask our audience to be brave with us. Please stand if you yourself have experienced a mental health challenge or if you love someone who has. Take a look around at this. That's everybody. That's that one in five people that we're talking about. Thank you for standing and being brave with us. We are all affected by mental illness, and simply being here today was an incredible start to building upon a movement of people who are willing to be more open, more, suppo more supportive of those struggling. We hope that you'll think of This Is My Brave and that you use your experience tonight that you shared with us as a way to start the conversation and keep it going. This is what it means to live brave. We'd love to meet you in the lobby where we can get together and visit with some of our sponsors and the cast. You can meet all the famous people up here. <laughs> and remember to visit the Show Us Your Brave poster where you can share your story as well. But first, how about one more round of applause for our Eagle County, Colorado storytellers. And that's all we have. Thank you for attending. <laughs>